Zoom. And then we're gonna do the broadcast. And then we'll transfer everyone to us uh, attend the Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, the uh, Emory uh, lecture, a series lecture. Uh, it's about 12 o'clock. Uh, today is Monday, uh, September the 14th. Uh, today we have a fantastic speaker, a colleague, a friend, is someone that we all look uh, forward uh, up to. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Lee is an uh, MSK radiologist in the Department of Radio uh, MSK Radiologist in the Department of Radiology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, Dr. Lee completed his fellowship training in MSK and intervention at the University of Wisconsin in 2008. He has been a faculty member for the radiology department there and a professor, full professor, um, yeah, since 2019. So thank you so much. Uh, congratulations on achieving this important uh, 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 achievement. Uh, his research and clinical interests have primarily related to MSK ultrasound and minimally invasive therapies of a sports injury, developing, translating imaging applications, such as quantitative ultrasound elastography and regenerative medicine therapies for overused tendon injuries. He has successfully received multiple peer-reviewed grant awards for tendon elastography and plasma-rich, plasma, uh, bailey-rich plasma therapies. He has published over 50 peer-reviewed manuscripts in the MSK literature and given over 175 national and international presentations. Dr. Lee has served as an ABR oral board examiner, RSNA and ISSS scientific review committee member, chair of the IUM MSK ultrasound group and IUM board member in SSR and ISSS, which is the International Society of MSK committee member. So it's a pleasure to have him here today. He's gonna to talk to us about PRP, uh, tenotomy and stem cell injections. Uh, just before we start, I'm gonna share my screen here. Bear with me here for one second. Okay, let's do this one more time. So this is part of the uh, MSK education uh, visiting professor electorship. This web webinar series is meant for educational purposes only. All interaction features for attendees have been disabled to ensure optimal quality for all viewers. Please email questions to Emory, MSK, radiology at gmail.com. Again, Emory, MSK, radiology at gmail.com. If time permits, at the end of the presentation, these questions may be addressed by the speaker as time uh, allowed. Announcements will be made as to whether it, uh, the uh, uh, video will be recorded, which is, is going to be recorded, and it will be uploaded to the YouTube channel, Emory MSK Radiology. Attendees have not been given any permission to screen record any of these talks, which may contain material on the copyright, unauthorized recording, use, distribution, and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. This webinar series is brought to you by the MSK Imaging Division at Emory University. So with that, I will transition over to uh, Dr. Lee, who will share his presentation and uh, begin presenting. Great, thank you very much. Um, you know, what a wonderful e-series that you have worked so hard to put together for the attendees, not just from what I hear in the United States and also across the world. Um, it is a unique time and I'm kind of bummed that I can't see you in person or that my video doesn't work, but i um, really happy to be here and honored to be here. So I'd like to thank Felix and Monica and Adam for putting this together, um, you know, where I get to share with you our experience on advanced MSK ultrasound procedures uh, that we do at our institutions. And a lot of questions that I get is, which one do we do, PRP, tenotomy, or stem cells? 
So these are my disclosures, um, just so you're aware uh, with this picture. This is Madison, which is the state capital of Wisconsin, where the University of Wisconsin is at. You can see the capital right here, uh, separated by the two lakes of Lake Mendota and Lake Monona. It's a very pretty uh, typical college town, about 300,000 people. Um, just to give you a reference point, we're about 150 miles north of Chicago, where RSNA is at. So it's a little bit colder in the wintertime, but a beautiful place to visit in the spring and summer. So hopefully you'll get to come visit us one day. So the objectives of this talk is to introduce the concept of tissue healing. And what I mean by the different tissues are the ones listed here, tendon, ligament, muscle, bone, and nerve in the MSK system. There's, you know, the literature is ripe with all of these, but I'm going to concentrate on tendon where um, is most uh, prevalent in. We'll discuss what to inject. Um, there are many things, um, but the four that we'll have time to talk about is the four listed here. Steroid, which is pretty prom prominent. I think every one of us injects steroids in different places. Percutaneous tenotomy, which is also known as dry needling. Uh, Platelet-rich plasma, or short PRP. And then we'll talk about stem cells. We don't um, inject stem cells, but I want to kind of discuss uh, what the state of it is now and if we should be doing this at all. And then um, you'll see uh, in a little bit of preview, really um, there's no clear evidence for any of these per se. So let's, let's talk about that more. All right, so tendon structure, if you, you, you're probably familiar with what a normal tendon looks like under ultrasound. And so I'm showing you a long axis here, the posterior tibial tendon demarcated by the yellow arrowheads. Um, you can, and then on the left is my cartoon drawing of a tendon um, and what we're seeing. This is uh, dense fibrous connective tissue. They're collagen type one. Uh, they resist tensile loads. And you can see here, each individual tendon is made up of these fascicles or secondary bundles. Um, the diameter is anywhere from 150 to 1,000 micrometers. Within those fascicles are their fibrils, or 15 to 300 micrometers. So what are we seeing under ultrasound? Those, those thin linear parallel structures. We call it a fibrillar pattern. We're thinking it's the fibers, but I was talking to my ortho surgeon um, who you know, have done anatomic studies and correlating this. And, and if you combine that with ultrasound and the wavelengths, you know, anywhere from typical 10 to 12 megahertz, we're resolving, you know, you know, we're able to resolve structures that are 175 micrometer wavelengths here. We're probably seeing the fascicle level under ultrasound rather than the fibrils. But nonetheless, this is what it, a normal tendon looks like under ultrasound. So this will be important when we're showing you abnormal cases throughout the talk. Let's talk a little bit about mechanical behavior of tendon and tendon strengths and what we see. You know, a lot of the patients that come to us, you know, with tendon injuries, they're all typically overuse injuries. Um, not, not um, you know, trauma is a small subset, but, you know, we're seeing people with workmen's comp type of injuries, you know, sports injuries that they've sustained over the years. Tendons are poorly vascular, vascularized, so therefore they're, they're difficult to heal on their own, very slow. Um, and then, you know, the terms tendonitis and tendinosis, you know, I just introduced them here because, you know, clinically, you know, a lot of people think tendonitis is an acute phase, which, you know, honestly, you know, um, patients do experience, but they don't really see their clinician during that time. They kind of wait it out, they get better, and then the problem recurs. And over time, you know, that, that pain and dysfunction starts to increase in duration. That's when they decide to go see their doctor. And by then, when we're imaging them, either by ultrasound or MRI, it's more of a chronic overuse state or tendinosis is what we'll see. And, and you'll see that throughout the talk. So the stress strain curve is pretty classic. Benedict uh, described this in, you know, in the late 60s. And you can see what the tendon, if you stretch a tendon, um, what the strain goes through and the stress as we increase this from the toe to the linear part to the failure part. So at the strain level, 2%, all the way to 12%, we're at the failure rate. Um, repetitive load is between 4 and 8%. So it kind of lives at this linear portion right here for tendon, when we talk about tendon strength. Well, what about tissue healing then in this setting? Well, once you injure the tendon, you can get fibrous tissue formation that can lead to scarring. You know, when you think about the healing phases uh, of the tendon, we learned this in medical school, right? 
inflammation, proliferation, remodeling. It's a pro-inflammatory state, and it starts with platelet function as well. And um, what happens is these tendons, as they're healing and develop scar, they actually become less flexible. Uh, they have decreased biomechanical properties, and it's important to think that the heel tendon is doesn't really equal the intact tendon. And you know this is important when we relay this to our patients. You know when a lot of times when we're injecting steroids for pain relief, um, I tell the patients in their consent process, you know this this doesn't heal the tendon. And I would say 50% of the patients are surprised to hear that. They're like, wait a minute, why am I doing this if this is not healing anything? If it's just masking my pain, I may not want to do this. And so that's a discussion that we have with our patients. Um, an animal study showed that an Achilles tendon rupture where you have spontaneous healing um, and they tested that one year, it was only 50%, 57% of the normal strength. So again, the healed tendon isn't, isn't exactly the, the same thing as a normal intact tendon. So let's define the problem of tendinosis. Well, 7% of all physician office visits in the United States um, deal with this overuse injury. Up to 50% of all sports injuries, 30% in runners. You can see here, this is Kevin Durant who injured or ruptured his Achilles tendon in game five of the 2019 finals. There, it has a large socioeconomic impact and quality of life and it's often refractory to conservative management. Current therapies fail to promote tendon healing. And so that's, that's where the million dollar question is, what can we use? And right now there's really a lack of evidence for what we should be doing in a very methodical way. So there are some clinical approaches, um, you know, just like the rest and ice and NSAIDs, corticosteroids, eccentric exercises, but if you notice the evidence rating, there's really nothing that's consistently of high quality evidence here for using even conservative management therapies. So what are some ultrasound changes of tendinosis? This is a SAGE um, T1 of the Achilles tendon. Uh, we'll rotate this here for those who um, aren't used to seeing Achilles tendon under ultrasound. We place the patient in a prone position. The ankle and foot are kind of dangling off the table a little bit right there, and that's the long axis approach. You can see um, the normal appearance of the Achilles, kind of similar to the posterior tibial tendon that I showed you before, right? It's normal and uniform in echo texture and size. Um, you can see by the red arrow, the retro uh, calcaneal bursitis in this person. This video was given to me by one of our mechanical engineering collaborators, um, basically, you know, kind of tracking the stress on the tendon uh, by those black tape markers and you can see how the Achilles tendon undergoes a lot of stress during running here. In this same patient on the right, over a year, you can see how the tendon got thicker. Um, it's a little bit more hypochoic. The hypoechogenicity is more of kind of a fibrous tissue that's forming. Um, and then the normal side of the contralateral side, uh, you can compare that with ultrasound. If I put power Doppler, you can see some hyperemia involving the tendon as well. Um, you can see the thickened wall of the retrocalcaneal bursa over time. In a different patient, you can see in the 55-year-old female, um, this thickening and hypoechogenicity uh, in different parts of that mid-substance Achilles. This is what classic, what I probably call mild or mild to moderate mid-substance Achilles tendinosis looks like. No fluid-filled gap or tear or surfacing tear that I see. But what's the dreaded complication of this is in this patient who is a 55 year old male comes in with dynamic imaging, you can see that Achilles tendon um, complete rupture there of the mid substance. So we're trying to prevent this from happening. So what are some treatment of tendinosis? Well, the goal is for pain relief and improved function, right? Good news is 80% do recover with conservative management um, in the beginning. But over time, you keep on injuring your tendon, you take this into this disrepair state that there might be a point of no return, really, where um, patients may require surgery, if, if that. Unfortunately, it, it can take three to six months before resolution. Chronic pain is common, and there is prone to recurrent injury here. So, so it's really, it's, this is a really difficult thing that we see every day in our clinical practice, and it's really tough to treat. So let's start with steroids of the four that we list here. Um, I'm just gonna briefly go over 
steroids and percutaneous needle tonotomy and spend most of our time on platelet-rich plasma and stem cells. Uh, mainly because we all know some of the indications and very familiar with steroid injections. Uh, for our institution, you know, where, where to inject? Some examples. We, we teach our fellows and our residents, you know, inject steroids in spaces around tendons. Don't inject inside tendons because we don't want to rupture them or weaken them. So, for example, tendon sheaths. This is a long head biceps tendon, the short axis. You can see our 22 gauge, one and a half inch needle coming in from a lateral to medial approach, just lateral to the um, biceps tendon underneath that transverse ligament, and we're injecting in real time right, that, that uh, steroid and anesthetic combo. Subacromial subdeltoid bursa, um, when patients come in with lateral sided shoulder pain, um, impingement-like syndrome um, pain, then we're asked to inject the bursa there, and that's something we can easily do under ultrasound. Tennis elbow, lateral epicondylosis. You know, there's this one study from JAMA that I quote all the time with our patients, and sometimes our referring providers who want to order this, and I, I get an order and say, hey, inject your tennis, your tennis elbow with steroid, I really take a lot of pause, you know, just because this study showed there's a 73% recurrence after steroid injection. Um, it's not helpful in the long term. Actually, pain may come back worse after, you know, during the recurrence phase, and it may be harmful to the tendon. And so, um, you know, right now we avoid steroid injection uh, into the lateral epicondylosis or tennis elbow patients. All right, so for percutaneous tenotomy or dry needling, this is, it can be done with or without a biologic, meaning like PRP or stem cells, but this one is done without, uh, typically 20 to 30 passes. And the literature uh, uh, needle gauge is anywhere from 19 to 22. We use 22 gauge needles. This is a in plane, um, long axis to the proximal patella. You can see us targeting um, that deep portion of the patellar tendon, which is the most common location where we see patellar tendinosis. tendinosis. Um, I can feel the scar tissue as we're going in and out of that area. I really target the anthesis. I really think the pain is generated from those tiny tendon abulsions from the patella or the bone interface there. Um, Oftentimes when we place the needle on top of the bone, patients can really feel that and they say, yep, that is definitely my pain. So we're, again, this dry needling is trying to create this inflammation, this pro-inflammatory um, state so that you take this from this disrepair phase into more of a repair phase, uh, but it can take some time. Here's another example, long axis common flexor tendon medial epicondyle on someone who's a golfer. You can see our 22 gauge and you'll go in and, um, you know, really addressing the thicker part of the tendon. If there's hyperemia, I um, go for that area as well and the anthesis. So those are the three areas that we really target here. There is a single prospective study. It was a small volume, 14 patients, and their uh, pain levels decreased at both 4 and 12 weeks. And this is just a, a variety of different tendinopathies that they that they looked at. I wanted to spend one slide on this, 10X, um, ultrasonic tenotomy, dry kneeling also, mainly for recalcitrant tendinosis, because I get a lot of questions about 10X. 10X um, is pretty pervasive out there. It's also you know, seen in other fields as well. It's FDA approved. Um, it, it's basically, uh, the mechanism is based off phaco emulsification or barred by our ophthalmology colleagues when they treated cataracts. Um, so you can see this image on the top right that I took from 10X Health. Uh, it's a double lumen needle, 18 gauge, 32 millimeters in length. And basically you target the angiofibroblastic tissue to debris and suction. Um, we, ha we have not instituted 10X at our place because I don't feel like it's any better than dry needling itself. I understand um, the debriding and suction, uh, more of a surgical procedure type of thing, and so there may be benefit. However, there's really limited evidence. Um, uh, right now, from what I've seen, there's only case series out there. There's no control group. There's no large study. Um, in fact, there's a couple of surgery literature where they discuss debridement um, using 10x in the Achilles, and it, and it, it went on to rupture. So um, you, we have to be careful about um, using new technology and really vetting it out, um, to, you know, with limited evidence. All right, platelet-rich plasma. 
So why this rationale for using PRP or stem cells or this collective term called orthobiologics? Here in the bottom right, you can see in our 45-year-old tennis elbow, you can see lateral epicondyle, the bony acoustic landmark. Um, I like this image because it just, um, you know, long axis, I usually show it to you without hyperemia, but I, I'm showing you the needle uh, 22 gauge inside the common extensor tendon in areas that we target that tend to be hypochoic and hyperemic. You know, MSK tissues like the tendons, they really have poor healing capacity. They don't see a lot of blood flow. Undergo degenerative changes. Um, we see it happening in more younger patients just because, you know, you know, sports is all year round now, right? And they start at a really young age. And, you know, I see, you know, 13, 14 year olds now coming in with shoulder injuries and elbow injuries and wrist injuries. It's, it's becoming more prevalent. Um, there's a strong desire to return to activity. I don't know about you, but in my experience, when we treat them, my patient always asks me, when can I get back to my activity? When can I start playing football, basketball? Can I start tomorrow or the next day? And so it's a real, um, um, conversation, you know, with these patients. And then, you know, some people want to avoid surgery for orthobiologics. And just so you know, there's a treatment gap. There's a small percentage, I would say 20%, where, you know, when you think about 80% of um, patients that present with pain, you know, are improved with conservative measures. And then there's the extreme where there, there's a, the need for surgery. There's that 20% gap where what do you do for those patients? Um, who don't fit either of those two categories. Well, let's talk about background for PRP and PRP as a, a viable option for treating this. Well, you know, in the literature, the, the concentration ranges, but we've reported five times the platelets concentration in whole blood um, is basically a super physiologic amount, right? It's essential to healing, where you go undergo platelet activation to release the growth factors and then you have this inflammatory cascade of these pro-inflammatory mediators, cytokines, right? And then tendons have low vascularity, unlike muscles, for example, they have high vascularity, so they heal better. You know, because of the low vascularity, they have limited exposure to growth factors. And then PRP can deliver a high concentration of these growth factors to promote tendon healing. It's been reported that PRP can also cause neovascular, neovascularization, and that can bring in even more your own body's healing response um, for that for those areas. So I would just kind of want to give you a high level of evidence of some of the um, studies that have been in the literature reported to kind of give you an idea. Um, Pierre Booms in 2010 looked at tennis elbow, had 100 patients over a one year period, and they concluded that PRP was much, much better than steroid. DeVos, however, uh, looked at Achilles tendinosis, um, 54 over a 24 week period, injected PRP and they did a sham. And basically there was no difference between the two. PRP equaled saline. And then Dragu looked at jumpers in the patellar tendon neuropathy here. Um, level one, 23 patients, 26 week follow up. And at short term, um, when they compared PRP with dry needling, PRP was better. However, in the longer term, at 26 weeks, PRP was no different than dry needling in terms of pain and function. Recently, there was this article that came out in 2018, um, Efficacy of PRP as Conservative Treatment Orthopedics. It's a meta-analysis. They looked at a whole bunch of the tendinopathies, you know, from tennis elbow to Achilles, a plantar fasciitis, um, patellar tendon, or rotator cuff. And so that included 36 randomized control trials. And if you, if you add them up, there's about over 2,000 patients. The follow-up was only six months, though. I wish it was a little, you know, some studies went on to 12 months. Um, but of all the control groups, when they compared it to PRP, so the control groups were all these studies included dry needling, steroid injection, and saline, um, there was no difference between PRP and the control groups. Um, when you look at a six-month follow-up, this was a meta-analysis of randomized control trials. So it's something to think about when we're thinking about tendinopathy. So for us, when do we um, consider treating 
patients in our practice. Well, we normally do chronic tendon overuse injuries. We don't inject um, joints, which I'll share with you the literature on that briefly, but that's an area uh, that we're not typically asked to, enjoy, uh, to inject. We're asked to inject the labrum or the meniscus. Uh, we don't do that as well. Muscles occasionally, but we often don't um, inject PRP into muscles. So we're, we're really concentrating on overuse injuries of the tendons. Um, those tendons that have failed appropriate conservative management and really surgery is not an option. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of our technique. Um, here's a rotator cuff, 22 gauge, one and a half inch needle. I'm needling the abnormal area. You can see that cortical regularity, the footprint of greater tuberosity where the supraspinatus inserts on. I'm, at, I'm um, needling the anthesis as well there. And we're injecting three mLs of PRP. Um, this is a 22 gauge needle. Plantar fascia, it's a long axis. You can see by the red arrow, thickening of the plantar fascia, 22 gauge needle inside the plantar fascia. Um, and we're needling the abnormal areas inside that area and we're injecting three mLs of PRP in here as well. Here's an example of uh, jumper's knee or patellar tendinosis. You can see on this axial T2 weight at fat side image, the red arrow is showing increased T2 signal thickening of that central deep portion of the proximal patellar tendon. This is what that ultrasound in the same patient looks like. Hyperemia as well, hypoechogenicity. You can see our needle coming in. Um, I learned a few things when I did in the beginning where I prefer to do this um, short axis approach coming from a lateral to medial approach. Um, but then after a while, after doing a lot of these, <clears throat> I wanted to make sure I cover the entire area. So we actually started going long axis into the patellar tendon, um, kind of doing a fan approach um, and making sure I'm getting not just the central portion of this hypochoic defect or hypoechogenicity, but also just medial and lateral to it as well. Um, briefly, imaging outcome measures. Um, our sports medicine colleagues here at UW did a prospective study on 20 tendons in 14 consecutive patients. It's a younger age group, but mostly, mostly um, males. And we looked at the clinical MR and ultrasound data um, of these patients that were treated with PRP at baseline and one year post. And we basically asked the question, which ultrasound and MR features were helpful in determining patients getting better or worse? So you can see, on ultrasound, tendon thickness, hypoechogenicity, hyperemia, those are some of the morphologic changes that we look at every time when we're evaluating ultrasound um, of the tendon after PRP um, or at baseline. Intratendinous calcification, I don't see a lot of that, but we looked at that, and thesophyte, and then MRI, tendon thickness, signal abnormality um, on T2, some marrow edema that we can't see under ultrasound, fat pad edema, also difficult to see under ultrasound, and then enthesophyte. Um, the clinical score is IKDC insane. Um, at pre and post of all of patients, you can see that there was improvement in these patients. So given it's a prospective study, it's a um, small cohort of patients, there's no control. So take it for what that's worth. So some of the helping, helpful imaging features we found were tendon thickness. Um, so a decrease in thickness was, you know, what we found correlated with patient improve, pain improvement. Uh, for ultrasound, it was the hypoechogenicity that improved, and for MRI, it was a T2 signal abnormality that improved. So for example, this one, you can see on the SAG T2 um, thickening of that mid-substance of the patellar tendon here. This is the short axis image, or axial image. Um, Post-PRP, you can see that thickness was better, um, less signal, intrasubstance signal. There's a little bit more signal here, so that's kind of curious. Didn't know what to do with that, but I reported that as well. And then on the on the axial image here, also less T2 signal uh, on the post PRP in this patient who felt better. So uh, I mentioned, you know, the PRP application for joints um, and the rationale for injecting. Well, you know, it's a pretty prevalent disease. Arthritis Foundation here in the U.S. 30 million people suffer with OA. 14 million with knee OA, 700,000 get a total knee arthroplasty per year. That's, that's really high. And I know, um, true for our, our institution, I'm sure yours, 
um, that number keeps on growing. 500,000 for total hip arthroplasties per year. And by 2025, there's gonna be a 40% prevalence of this disease, so pretty remarkable. Um, this is a study that, only study that I found that kind of points to the utility of PRP for um, knee OA. Intraarticular injection of PRP, and they compared it with uh, hyaluronic acid and a sham, so a saline injection. It was a double-blinded randomized control trial. They had 87 patients. Uh, with knee OA, Kelgren Lawrence one and two uh, followed it, followed them for one year, and they found they concluded that PRP was much much better than hyaluronic acid and the sham injection. So that raised my eyebrow. Um, I talked to our orthopedic colleagues here; they saw it too. Um, but yet we were not injecting a lot of um, PRP into joints. I haven't gotten to that point. So what are the pros and cons of PRP? Well. The pros, you know, it's autologous, right? We don't have to worry about any kind of reaction. Right now, it's been reported to have a high safety profile, and that's true for our patients. Very mild side effects. Usually, that includes pain, you know, for the first 24 hours. We usually tell our patients to cover it with Tylenol. On the rare occasion, I will prescribe Tylenol number three, which is with codeine, but that's usually very rare. And, you know, it, it, it enables patients to possibly avoid surgery, which is a big plus. Some of the minuses, uh, and there's a lot, there's a lar larger list than the pros. Um, there are over 40 commercial systems of PRP. And I think that wherein lies um, the non-standardization approach of PRP in our country, and it makes it very difficult to establish PRP as a standard of care therapy. It's very heterogeneous. Um, LRLP, PRP, those stand for leukocyte rich, leukocyte poor, um, there's different about you know, you know, makeups of the PRP is what I'm getting to um, that have different indications per se, whether one's better or worse, and we can kind of go over that later. Um, different concentrations, for example, whole blood, there's, you know, it's not concentrated versus two times, all the way up to seven times concentration of PRP, which is better. Um, and the amount injected, <clears throat> we don't know that for sure. Um, and then out-of-pocket expense, obviously, in most places, it's pretty rare for insurance companies to reimburse for PRP. Um, it, can, it has a huge out-of-pocket cost on the order of thousands of dollars. All right, so let's um, spend the last 10 to 15 minutes on stem cells. What are stem cells? Well, I stole this picture from Mayo. I really liked it because this is what I thought of stem cells, where you have this kind of pluripotent cell. Um, it can mature in a different um, specialty cells like nerve cells, bone and cartilage, skin cells, and muscle cells, kind of what I thought. And then you inject it, whatever environment it's in, it'll, it'll um, predispose that differentiation into that piece of tissue. So if I inject in the arthritic joint, hopefully cartilage will form, is kind of what I was thinking. <clears throat> when you think of mesenchymal stem cells or these pluripotent cells, and what are we harvesting? And how much are we injecting? Is it making a difference? I, I, don't, I don't think of myself as a walking stem cell plant or you know, having a lot. And the literature you know, shows that in the newborn, you know, one out of every 10,000 cells are mesenchymal stem cells. But then as you get to a teenager, age 30, age 50, you know, that precipitously, precipitously drops, as you can see. So this term mesenchymal stem cell, this, Let's dig in a little bit further on that. It's a really confusing term. There's very pop various populations of cells. There's unclear biologic function. Um, a prominent journal, Nature, says, hey, let's clear up the stem cell mess, right? Um, the literature wants to move away from the term stem cells because really, are they really stem cells? Kind of what I'm pointing to. Professional societies like the International Society for Stem Cell Research cellular therapy, they're also saying, let's move away from this term because it's very confusing. But the literature is showing that it's very difficult to move away from this term. As you can see from 95, uh, we have six papers you know, um, published using the word mesenchymal stem cells if you did a literature search. And then over time, the, the next couple of decades, we now have just under 4,000 publications using the term mesenchymal stem cells. 
So it's really hard to get rid of it once you start it, right? The snowball is going down the hill already. I got a chance to listen to Dr. Arnold Kaplan, biologist, um, gave a really good talk on stem cells and how he coined this term actually in 1991, um, you know, for a cell type derived from bone marrow. But then over time, you know, in, including the talk that he gave, he said, we shouldn't be calling these mesenchymal stem cells. I made a mistake. It's not the stem cells that we think of, um, kind of what I introduced in the beginning, these pluripotent cells. In 2017, he came out and said, look, we should recommend this term medicinal signaling cells. Also short MSC, so it's still kind of confusing. But um, he recognizes that this term is confusing and we should be moving away from that. Well, what's the result of that? Is this sales pitch? You know, people are capitalizing on mesenchymal, this whole confusion about MSCs. It, it, it allows for the selling of unproven techniques, treatments, you know. Um, so just to give you an example, there are 351 direct and consumer US companies that was reported um, in 2016. <clears throat> That's 570 clinics. It's a $5 billion industry. So no wonder uh, people wanna capitalize on this. You know, the lay population has no, they have no idea. Um, you know, they hear stem cells, they think about its potential, and they go and inject because they really want treatment. They want to get pain relief um, for whatever they are suffering from. The FDA in 2018 had 45 enforcement actions, uh, including two of those were right here in Madison um, who opened up their stem cell clinics. So New York Times 2019 reported stem cell treatments flourish with little evidence that they work. So this picture, you can see this physician drawing up blood from probably the person's iliac caress there. Regenex, um, I'm sure you guys have heard of this. It's this company that's pretty much you know, all over the US and you can see this list that I pulled and copied from their website um, you know, where they can treat all these ailments, you know, the top left, ACL tears in the knee, for example, all the way to the spine. They can treat spinal stenosis, for example. Um, <clears throat> all different parts of the country. Here's a better um, diagram of it showing all the different hotspots, right, for um, stem cell areas. You can see maybe there's four or five in the Atlanta area. There's several in Wisconsin as well. So what are the different stem cell types um, and what are they marketed? Well, adipose, like fat stem cell, fat derived stem cells, and then the bone marrow derived stem cells. You can see um, the fat kind of outweighs the bone marrow here. And then the number of businesses that market, you know, stem cells, um, offering stem cell treatment. You can see orthopedics is by far the number one, right? All the way down, you can see to dental, cancer, pediatric diabetics, sleep, so where are some cons? Because obviously I haven't really talked about any pros yet or at all of stem cells. Right now there's no clear evidence that it works. Current therapies are way ahead of the research and that's been true for any of these orthobiologics. Um, PRP also. Right now there's a lot of literature clinically for osteoarthritis. I mean, there's a lot of animal literature, a lot of basic science literature as well. But if you kind of um, look at the clinical translational research, osteoarthritis is by far the most common indication. Really no tendon or ligament studies that you know, I feel comfortable re reporting. The safety profile has yet to be established. So what are they now? I just think they're just really expensive placebos. $5,000 for fat and bone marrow injections. You know, insurance does not cover experimental treatments, but Regenex, they're savvy. They have convinced their local employers uh, to cover it because they tell them by doing this is much cheaper than surgery. And so they've been successful at that. But we have to think about the ethics behind it, you know, the economic harm that, we're, that this potentially can cause because patients are in pain. You know, you really want relief from your pain um, and, function, and your dysfunction. Serious infections have been reported with stem cell therapy including blindness. So this is uh, a New England Journal of Medicine article in 2017 um, showing that someone who injected stem cells um, into, the, into the eye for vision loss uh, ended up having vision loss, which is pretty serious. 
this study, you know, um, Shane Shapiro is um, a well-known sports medicine physician at Mayo Clinic. He did a great study. I want to show it to you. It's a prospective single-blind placebo-controlled trial of bone marrow aspirate concentration. Short is BMAC, also another different name for stem cells for a knee osteoarthritis. And he recruited 25 patients that had bilateral knee OA or osteoarthritis, injected stem cell or BMAC in one and then saline in the other. And then they followed them up six months post-injection. And they found that both knees improved actually, and that there is no statistical significant difference between the two sides. So um, probably you know need higher N uh, instead of 25, but right now, no advantage to doing stem cells. At the same time, and it reported separately, was um, an imaging component, which was very interesting. They did a quantitative T2 MR mapping and did a 12-month follow-up in that randomized controls trial that I just talked to you about. They looked at, they used a Siemens Leonardo workstation and looked at T2 mapping of all compartments. You can see the baseline on the top right, pre-BMAC image, and then 12 month post on the bottom right here. To your eye, I don't know what you think, if it's there any difference between the two or not. They concluded at one year post, there was no statistical significant difference between the two. So from what they can tell, um, BMAC did not increase cartilage growth in these patients with NEOI. So injection therapy adoption, well, Orthobiologics is the, quote, next frontier. This is um, what I read in an editorial by Dr. James Andrews, who, for those of you who don't know, outside the United States, it's, uh, he's a prominent orthopedic surgeon. If you looked and read this editorial, they talk about how ortho has really progressed as a field from back in the day and how arthroscopy, or minimally invasive scopes, right, um, have changed ortho. The next was like arthroplasty, how knee joints replacement, hip joint replacements have really changed the feel. So this next frontier is this orthobiologics. So minimally invasive orthopedic procedures that include PRP, stem cells, other things. Um, however, you know, in order for this to be adopted, we need rigorous study methodology. Blinding has a, has a large component um, to adopt this. Standardized quantitative methods for cell harvesting, processing, characterization, delivery. There's a lot of aspects of this that people have to think about. And then finally, standardized reporting of all clinical and structural outcomes. Um, whether that includes imaging or not, I think this is something that needs to be done in order for any of this to be standard of care. So, you know, there's this proposed treatment algorithm. What should we do? Well, as you can, as you know, it's challenging. There's a lot of different tendinopathies. There's upper extremity, lower extremity, weight bearing. Um, you know, it's, it's very challenging. There are multiple factors. You know, how long has this patient been dealing with this pain? Uh, what's the age of the patient, the fitness level? Does the patient, you know, have systemic disease that contribute to tendon disease and the cost, obviously? So there's this tier level, it's kind of a guide, it's not something that's set in stone, but you know, uh, Dr. Evan Peck, who's also a sports medicine, um, you know, shared this with me, um, it's unpublished, I think he was planning on publishing it, but basically it's no different than what we think about in our mind, where you go from conservative management to surgery. So you try the active modification in tier one to ex you know, eccentric exercise in tier two, percutaneous tanami or dry kneeling in tier three. Why is that over PRP or before? I think because insurance will cover dry kneeling in some areas, uh, unlike PRP. Um, and then tier four, PRP, um, I don't include stem cells, as you can see from what I've discussed. And then finally, surgery. So in summary, tendinosis is a significant problem with high socioeconomic cost. There's no effective standard treatment right now. Um, steroid injections is very prevalent. We do it all the time, right? We, we have to talk to our patients about the risks and the benefits, um, but especially in tennis elbow, it's very discouraged and we don't inject steroids into tendons uh, in that area. We talked about the proposed treatment algorithm. It's good to have that guide in your head, 
um, because it is challenging and it, it is it seems like it's all over the place. And it's, it's good to know how to approach the patients where they're at in that treatment algorithm. There's limited evidence um, from what I can tell and what I've presented, uh, except PRP and NeoA, which is kind of interesting. Uh, there's this whole milieu uh, in the knee joint, including the synovium, that PRP can help maybe arrest the cartilage degeneration when you think of early OA. Advanced OA, not so much. Um, there's this increasing problem, you know, with tendinopathy and this treatment gap exists. So as you can tell, a lot of the treatments are um, being done without the research. It's just really getting ahead as, as I'm talking about. Um, and that's because <clears throat> there's a real problem that exists and really there's no standard of care. And somehow we have to nail this down. When you have clinical use has outpaced the evidence, it's really important to do this. But again, I think it's, it's jeopardized because of this. It's really hard um, when we think about you know, the stem cell clinics, the PRP clinics out there, it may really impede the progress uh, of orthobiologics. So if it is to be the next frontier, as Dr. Andrew is saying, I really think rigorous combined basic translational clinical research is needed. Otherwise, be very careful when you're reading these articles um, before you implement any of these changes into your practice. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a real pleasure um, to be here to present online. It's a different experience. I'm in my office now at University of Wisconsin. I'm about to go on procedures this afternoon, um, but uh, I'm, I'm here to take any of your questions. Oh, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, this is a, uh, a great opportunity to hear about your experiences uh, with anatomy and PRMP and stem cell. Um, uh, we will go over a few questions if you have time right now. Do, yeah. do you have some time? Oh yeah, definitely. Perfect. Uh, so the uh, some of the questions that came in um, in the uh, for the tenotomy procedures that you do, you mentioned that uh, it seems like most of those procedures that you do are uh, done utilizing a 22 gauge needle uh, usually. Have you seen any evidence of? Um, if, if the gauge of the needles uh, change, for example, using an 18 gauge or 16 gauge versus 22 gauge, how, how, based on your experience and, and your knowledge of the literature, has there ever been a study uh, that have compared different needle gauges and uh, different degrees of success uh, post uh, procedurally with uh, you know, how patients feel afterwards? Yeah, that's a good question. I have not seen any literature that, that um, investigates different gauges and outcomes. Um, my, of, of other applications, uh, like for example, calcific lavage and other things that I've seen in literature, uh, I really don't think gauge matters um, per se. Now, I don't know if I would use a 16 gauge or 14 gauge or you know, 13 gauge you know, um, in a tendon. I think that's a little overkill. And I think 20 to 22 is definitely reasonable. Um, I think the literature has um, looked at anywhere from 19 to 22 gauge and has success with that. The PRP literature is the same, of nine, about eight, 19 to 22 gauges um, needle for, for that use. So um, I really don't think there's, um, I, don't, I don't think there's gonna be a difference in outcome with gauge use. Just don't use the larger gauges for tendons, um, in my opinion. Perfect. Oh, thank you so much. Another question is, do you usually abrade the uh, the intesis, like uh, the junction between the tendon and the uh, periosteum, uh, you know, that junction there? Uh, when you do the tenotomy, do you usually abrade that area? Oh, yeah. That's, the that's I think, the most important area. Um, as I was saying, like, the little tendon involutions that we see, you know, or that's happening from the anthesis is probably what's causing the pain. And, you know, um, needling that area of the anthesis, not just in dry needling, but in PRP, uh, that's, that's probably the most important area, followed by the areas that are disease in the tendon with hyperemia. So thickening, hypoechogenicity, and the hyperemia that we see. Perfect. Um, another question uh, that came in was, how do you see shear wave, I know that you didn't speak specifically, you mentioned it briefly, but uh, how do you think that shear wave elastography uh, uh, will fit into bedding these therapies moving forward 
And are there specific aspects of our tendon matrix changes that you think it will be useful, useful to, to measure in the future? Basically using shear wave elastography as a way to assess for tendon healing and recovery after the procedure. Oh, I like this question. Great question. I didn't include my research in it, but that's the area that I'm looking at. Um, how shear wave speed can be an outcome measure to track healing of tendons. I think it has a lot of promise. Um, Tendon, tendinopathy is difficult to evaluate on its own, just morphologically. Um, we know that just thickening, hypoalkogenicity, and hyperemia in those combination really doesn't tell you much about how a patient feels after treatment. Um, so I think using a biomechanical measure like Shearway speed, where we're tracking the sound of the speed of sound through abnormal and normal tendon and how that perhaps increases with, with um, healing response or decreases uh, with or no change with no healing, I think it will be important going forward. Um, there are more studies out there that are showing these. Um, there's variability it's in this early stage. I wouldn't say that um, it's translatable right now, although I'm seeing and hearing that people are pushing the envelope and starting to do that, which I think is totally fine, just so you know the limitations of it. Um, limitations being, you know, variability, um, repeatability, for example. Um, the technique is, is, is pretty sensitive, whether you're placing a lot of pressure on the tendon, if you have an adequate gel pad, what's the position of the tendon? We know that if the tendon is stretched too much, it falsely elevates your waist beads. Um, so standardizing that approach, I think a lot of work has to be done still. But what we're seeing um, in our research studies is that there's a lot of promise where shear wave speed does correlate with pain and dysfunction. So I, ha I think it's a lot of promise. I'm hoping it, it will, you know, five years from now or maybe 10 years from now, we'll be using it in different areas. But I think the jury's still out. Uh, Ken, thank you so much again. I, I'm going to bundle these three questions, the next three questions, uh, and uh, forgive me if it's too much. Um, you, you mentioned that you used anatomy for specific tendons. You mentioned the rotator cuff, patella, for example. I think it was Achilles in the uh, medial and lateral uh, uh, elbow uh, regions. Um, in terms of success, like, wh where do you think, if you were to rank those places, right, from the most, you know, the, the tendons that you get the most success to the tendons that you get least success, uh, can you even, can you do that? Can you mention, you know, I have great experience, you know, the, I think anatomy works the best in this tendon and the least, you know, in these other tendons. And the second question was, do you use a, if in the presence of a uh, partial thickness tendon tear, do you use any criteria to perhaps use PRP with anatomy if, for example, tear is better than 50%? And lastly, uh, you mentioned that PR, PRP is, the literature is, is not uh, perhaps, you know, definitive. Uh, there are some studies that show uh, benefit, but some studies that don't show any benefit for tendon healing uh, after procedure like tenotomy. Uh, how do you make the decision how to use PRP? Is it based on uh, referral from, from the orthopedic uh, uh, colleagues or how, how do you make a decision on when to use PRP, for example? Thank you. All right, um, great questions. Um, please remind me if I forget, you know, the second and third, but the first one, Tenotomy and what areas have I seen success? I think I can group that into both tenotomy and PRP because I think uh, um, it's probably true for both in some sense. What we found is that um, is true. Certain tendinopathies that we treat react better than others. Um, I have not gotten great success with hamstring tendinopathies, with rotator cuff, and the Achilles. Those are tough. I would say of the three, Achilles a little bit better than the other. And then, you know, Achilles over rotator cuff over hamstring in our um, experience. Um, it could be a patient population as well um, that, that has an effect. Tennis elbow, patellar tendon, plantar fasciitis um, have gotten great success with dry needling or PRP is what we've found. Um, Muscles, you know, I don't think PRP is great for that. Um, and, and, you know, I think for tenotomy, I, I don't think, you know, that's an area for tenotomy either. 
So hopefully I answered that one. So tennis elbow, patellar tendon, plantar fasciitis, where we get most of our, our success in. Um, Second question, partial thickness tears, you know, 50% tear or less or more. Um, I, th I think for us, we tend to treat non-surfacing tears like intrasubstance tears or tendinopathy. Um, I will go after shallow partial thickness tears if you twist my arm. Otherwise, 50% or more, I don't treat those. Uh, so deep partial thickness tears. Uh, full thickness tears, I don't treat those as well. So I, I really don't know if I don't think that's that's too helpful. Um, and then lastly, I think your last question is, um, literature is not definitive between PRP versus Tanami. How do we choose? It is a lot driven by our referring providers. Our, our providers are sports medicine and ortho. They're pretty sophisticated um, in this knowledge. I think mainly because you know, we have this close collaboration and research. Uh, we've researched on tennis elbow, plantar fasciitis, patellar tendon, Achilles. They kind of know what works in what areas. Um, they also balance that though with the patient um, needs um, as far as if they want to pay out of pocket for PRP or if they want to try the dry kneeling first. Um, they have that conversation knowing, you know, they present it in a way um, where they feel the patient feels comfortable. So they come to us. Uh, for PRP or dry needling from the get-go. We don't, we have never really changed it on the fly for them. So to answer your question, a lot of it's just provider driven. So hopefully I answered your question yeah, there. You did. Just one more last question that said we close the uh, forum. Uh, is there any uh, application of PRP uh, in treating nerves? So neuropathic pain, for example, or, you know, in, uh, you know, sometimes we perform uh, anesthetic cortisone injection for nerve pain, for example. Is there any, have you seen any application on PRP for that? And that will be that will be the last question. Yeah, good question. I have not. Um, I'm I'm sure the literature talks about it. Um, at our institution, we are usually asked to inject steroids instead because a lot of it's just neuritis. Um, we see some neuropathies. Uh, long-standing. So we'll try the steroid injection to see. I would say um, a third of them do really well and just come back for, you know, repeated steroid injections maybe three times a year, you know. But then there's some who progress and their pain returns and they need, they need surgery for decompression, um, for example. Um, and then there's a smaller group that actually go on to ablation. And so um, our treatment is more of steroid and then ablation for imaging guidance, um, or steroid, steroid injection and, uh, surgery. Um, PRP hasn't really fit into that algorithm for us. Ken? Yes. Hey, I'm sorry. This is Adam Singer. Uh, we had a couple of additional questions. If you have time rolling on the email. Yeah, sure. Um, if you don't mind, um, the first one I uh, had a, a series of questions. Um, the first of which was, what would be the general definition for failure of conservative treatment? Uh, how long has the patient been in physical therapy for determining failure of treatment? For example, rotator cuff tendinopathy. Yeah, I mean, usually three to six month trial. Um, mostly at our institution is, is greater than six months and the conservative measures are the rest, um, the anti-inflammatories the eccentric exercises, depending on what tendinopathies, um, and then function. So, and then as far as a pain level cutoff or a functional cutoff, um, it's more in, cl in a clinical setting driven by their clinical presentation, um, as far as their age, what sport they're in or what area of work they're in and how fast or immediate they need pain relief from their ailment. If it's a research study, then we have strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, like a vast pain level of five or more for you know greater than six months, and you have to have failed at least two of the three conservative measures that we've done. So that's kind of, that kind of puts you in this moderate, um, moderate category of tendinopathy versus like the mild category. Got it. Um, for uh, rotator cuff partial thickness tears, 
uh, if you're going to use PRP, do you feel that there's any difference injecting bursal sided or articular sided tears in terms of efficacy? Um, I, I think for the majority that we're treating are the uh, ten tendinosis that I showed in the talk. Um, when it's shallow, we tend to treat articular sided just because the prevalence of articular sided tears are greater than bursal. Um, we haven't really have a lot of experience with shallow bursal sided, thick, you know, uh, partial thickness tears. So I really can't speak to that. Um, but I, I do know when we do the shallow articular sided, you know, we're, we're really um, concentrating on the anthesis, the cortical irregular, the greater tuberosity, and then injecting PRP inside the tendon and deep to it, like in the articular side, not so much on the bursal side or in the bursa. Okay, and then the last one from this um, person, uh, they asked, um, do you typically image after PRP injection? And if so, by ultrasound or MR, and how long would you wait? Uh, we do. Um, a lot of times we'll do it three months or six months after. Um, and it all depends. If they started with ultrasound, we would do another ultrasound. If they started with MRI, we would repeat with another MRI. Okay. Um, another question from a different person. Uh, for needle tenotomy, do you use any specific code? And if they can't pay, do you use autologous blood over PRP? Um, we, I can't speak to the code. Fortunately, I have uh, another team of people um, that has to deal with that. I don't have to really think about that. So I can't speak to the code. Um, and uh, if we do dry needling, we'll just do dry needling. I won't switch it to whole blood. Um, if it's PRP, we, we have, um, we use an Arthrex device and we use PRP. I won't switch it to whole blood. And if push comes to shove, the question is if, you know, we'll do whole, would you, will you do whole blood if the patient can't afford PRP? Um, we typically don't do that either. And I don't, I don't know if that's, like I said, any better or worse. So we, we tend to shy away from that. Okay. Last question. Um, how long should the patient wait uh, for restarting PT after PRP injection and specifically in the setting of uh, PRP for cuff tendinopathy slash tears, uh, epicondylitis, and knee OA? That's a good question. I think it's different for different tendinopathies, but there is, if you Google UW rehab PRP, you'll find our protocol. But typically what we do is we'll have the patient uh, completely shut down um, besides normal everyday like activities of daily living type of thing for two weeks. Um, and then after two weeks, they can start being mobile. And then isn't, it isn't until two months when they can start testing out their, their injury, whether it be gradual return to work or gradual return to sporting activity. Um, so that's, it's kind of like the two week and two month rule for us. That was it on our questions. Great. Great questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, yes. Ken, again. Thank you for all your time and, uh, you know, giving up uh, for new time to teach us all. I would really appreciate it. Um, keep doing good work. And everyone, thank you so much. Stay safe. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. You guys, too. I really appreciate it. It was an honor. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a good day. You as well.